This is level two of the CFA program, the topic on fixed income, and the reading on term structure and interest rate dynamics. We have heard over the years that level two candidates find this particular topic very challenging. And so our task here today is to present these LOSs to you in a framework under which you can understand at its base level, and then we can kind of maybe spread out this way and then maybe go into some depth so that you can get the subtle nature of these LOSs. But let me tell you what we're trying to do in this particular reading. We're trying to price a bond. And to price a bond, we need those future cash flows and we need a discount rate. So the term structure and interest rate dynamics has everything to do with how do we select that particular discount rate so that we can accurately price a bond. I mean, we can just pick up interest rate out of air. We could say, oh, let's use the inflation rate of 2.1%. And then here's the cash flow and we can calculate the price of the bond that way, but it's probably not gonna be too terribly accurate. So remember what we're trying to do here, are we're striving for accuracy and being able to predict and estimate what the price of a bond is so that we can become really super good financial analysts to be able to identify under and overvalued fixed income securities. So what we'll do in these LOSs is we'll look at uh, all sorts of different types of interest rates, spot rates, forward rates, et cetera, et cetera. Then we'll look at some models. We'll do some bootstrapping, which sounds like something that is not really out of a finance textbook, uh, but really what we're trying to do there is to estimate some implied rate that might not be observable. We'll talk about riding the yield curve and then we'll have some good slides on swap contracts and swap rates and then we'll move on to spreads and then we'll move on to traditional theories of the term structure and that's going to be my favorite part of this slide deck it might not be your favorite part but it's clearly my favorite part let's begin with that first los spot rates i'm guessing that you remember this from level one yield to maturity of a zero coupon bond. And so look at our timeline there. If we have a dollar at time period zero and we want to know what it's worth at time period lowercase t, all we need to do is multiply that one dollar times uh, one plus the spot rate raised to whatever that lower t time period is. Notice that second arrow point there at the bottom a spot curve shows the relationship between spot rates at different maturities. So, of course, there's a one-year spot rate and a two-year spot rate and a and a 12-year spot rate and a, I guess there's a thousand-year spot rate. You guys read there's a handful of bonds out there that have been issued over the last 20 years or so that have 1,000-year maturities. Now, of course, that spot rate reflects the borrowing and lending rate for a loan given today's conditions. But there are lots of institutions out there, and I imagine some individuals as well, who might be interested in borrowing money at some time in the future. So we need a forward rate of interest. So notice that definition there, the interest rate payable on a loan, which is agreed upon today, starting at some time in the future, lowercase t, and then repaid at maturity date, uh, uppercase t. So what we can do today is we can say, you know what, I need to borrow some money in five years and I want to lock in that rate. So let's go ahead and figure out what that rate is at some time in the future. That's called that forward rate. And then we can, of course, do that for, you know, a one year loan or a two year loan or a five year loan or a 10 year loan that begins in time period, you know, one or two or three or four or five. Probably not. Probably not a thousand like I just mentioned in the spot rates. Um, so you have this whole forward curve, graph showing the relationship between forward rates and the related terms to maturity. All right, so let's put that in our back pocket there. Keep spot rates and forward rates in our back pocket. Let's move on to yield to maturity. Yield to maturity, as I learned it way, way back in my first days of graduate school, my professors always called it the required return on the bond. And they explained it to us in the following way. They said, let's suppose you're a bondholder and a government entity or a corporation comes to you and says, hey, let me borrow a bunch of money. And you say, all right, I'll let you have my money. I'll let you have my capital. 
access to my capital, but I'm going to charge you an interest rate and you better pay me what I require. And that turns out to be the yield to maturity on the bond. Now, of course, the yield to maturity has a much broader meaning and it has some very limiting assumptions behind it. All right, you ready for this? So when, when we're looking at the yield to maturity, it's going to be, it's going to be the required return on the bond if, if the bond is held to maturity, if that bond does not default, and if all of the coupon payments are reinvested at the original yield to maturity. So you need to think about this. Let's go back to our 1,000 year bond that I just talked about a moment ago. Clearly, there's no way we're gonna hold that bond to maturity, but I guess our, our children and grandchildren and oh, however many generations that would take, I guess that could stay in the family for a 1,000 years. What's the chance that that bond is not gonna default over 1,000 years? I can't even process something like that. And then we have to reinvest the coupons at that original yield to maturity for a thousand years. I can't even rely on my children to take the garbage out weekly. How could I possibly rely on them to reinvest the coupons on a bond that I leave them after, uh, after I'm dead and buried? Uh, all right, so let's move on to this uh, to the bottom there expected return on the bond it's the return on on the bond that is anticipated over the investment holding period ah so the holding period may or may not be equal to the maturity date of the bond and so there's that last arrow point that i was saying ytm is the expected rate on a return if all three of those assumptions there in those uh, different colored flags in the middle of the slide deck if if they hold but here's the thing about yield to maturity on a bond. It's always, it's always the first interest rate that somebody mentions on the bond because it reflects current market conditions. And hopefully, hopefully it reflects things like credit risk and liquidity risk and interest rate risk and third party risk, and any of those other kinds of risks to which bondholders are exposed. Now the realized return on a bond, boy, didn't we learn this back in our very first accounting days. Realized means that you, uh, you sold your financial security and so you realized a rate of return. And of course, that realized return is based on the amount that the investor pays for the bond and then those reinvested coupons. And then those reinvested coupons are going to compound over time and that future value we call that the terminal value of the bond that depends on are you ready for this look over on the right hand side whether the yield curve is upward sloping whether it's downward sloping we don't show a flat one there because you can you can see and you can visualize what flat is over there so shape of the yield curve this is super important upward sloping yield curve just means that that long-term rates are higher than short-term rates. Downward sloping yield curve just means that long-term rates are lower than short-term rates. And then a flat yield curve implies that the yields on short-term bonds and long-term bonds are, are identical. And this is what I always remember from my graduate school professors about an upward sloping yield curve, is that yield curves are upward sloping in general, and we'll talk about this specifically in just a few moments. It just generally means that bondholders and investors believe that interest rates are going to rise over time. And that makes perfect sense. And then the downward sloping yield curve means that investors expect interest rates to fall over time. But but embedded in that downward sloping yield curve is some kind of an implicit thought that inflation has probably gotten away from us and that inflation is going to drop. And so that's going to be the driving force behind the downward slope. All right, how about this concept of bootstrapping? And this is, this is fascinating stuff for me. I love doing algebra, I love doing math. Uh, this is relatively straightforward, so you ought to be able to come up with uh, an answer on the exam because look, it's a, this LOS tells us that we have to just describe how we do this in, in bootstrapping. I'm gonna show you a mathematical example because I think describing is a lot easier once, once you see the math. But notice the quick definition there. It's really just a forward substitution method so that we can determine those zero coupon rates using the par yield curve. Remember the par yields are, are 
whatever the yield is that would force the bond to sell at a par value. So here are the steps. You're probably not going to memorize these steps in those three circles. Obtain spot rates for one year. Use the one year spot rate to determine the two year spot rate or the three or four or five, whatever it is. And then you can bootstrap and obtain that implied spot rate. So let me go ahead and show you how this works. So there's just a super simple example. Annual par rates, 2% for one year, 2.6% for two years. Now we know that the one year implied spot rate is 2% because that's going to be the one year par yield. But what we need to do is do our little algebra to compute that two year implied spot rate. So notice that we have one on the left hand side of the equal sign. That's just a $1 future value of a zero coupon bond. And so there is the discounting. So we have the 026 in the numerator divided by 1.02. There's that par rate. And then the one plus the 026 uh, in the numerator, that gives you the that gives you the coupon and then the maturity of one dollar, right? And then we're dividing by X. So that X, which is in the big parentheses over there, one plus uh, the implied rate and, and of course squares. So if you just do a little quick algebra, you get 2.61. So there are the par rates 2 and 2.6 and there are the implied spot rates 2 and 2.61. So that takes care of describing how zero coupon rates may be obtained from the par curve by bootstrapping. And by the way, those of you who take a look at the original reading, this really takes up just you know, a paragraph or two. But uh, working through the math here, you ought to be able to get that answer correct on the exam to describe. How about some assumptions concerning the evolution of spot rates in relation to forward rates implicit in active bond portfolio management? All right, so what are we trying to do here? We're trying to become better and more effective financial analysts. How do we do that? Well. We need to know about spot rates. We need to know about forward rates so that we can deliver a fixed income portfolio for our clients according to their risk and return objectives and all, all their constraints. All right, so look at these four assumptions here. Forward rates are biased predictors of future spot rates. All right, so what we can say then is that we have these forward rates. However, they are biased in predicting those future spot rates. This is a little bit different than what we're gonna talk about in those equity uh, readings. Notice the indented uh, circle point. The forward curve does not accurately forecast future spot rates. All right, so let's take a step back and say, all right, we can compute these forward rates. We know what they are today, and they're gonna help us price some of these kinds of future borrowings and lendings. However, they're not too terribly helpful when we want to try to predict future spot rates. So the active portfolio manager will try to outperform the bond market by forecasting how the future spot rates will differ from those reflected in the current forward curve. So that makes perfect sense to me that we, we have this, let's suppose we have this upward sloping spot curve and then we have an upward steeper sloping forward curve what we're trying to do then is to oh, minimize the difference between those two curves to identify those bonds that are undervalued. You see how this is just a little bit more subtle than saying something like, oh, I want to have my client invest in bonds when interest rates are going to fall. <laughs> then all bond prices rise and everyone's clapping and happy, happy and giving high fives. How about that third one here? This is a good uh, this is a good math one. The spot rate for a bond with a maturity greater than one equals the geometric mean of the one year one period spot rate and a series of one year forward rates. So that's important in knowing about geometric means and we'll do all of that stuff when we get to when we get to the equity chapter and we do some com computations of returns. And then there's some equations that you can value a bond of uh, known maturities. Now, what does this mean for us? So here's, here's the 
here's the deal. Look at those arrow gray box. If the expected future spot rate is less than the quoted forward rate, then the bond is undervalued. Of course, it has to be the same maturity. And then if the opposite occurs, then the bond is overvalued. So this is what we're trying to do as good financial analysts is find those overvalued and undervalued bonds. And what we're going to do is we're going to use the spot curve and we're going to use the forward curve and to try to estimate that difference there. Uh, look at the diamond points there. I think this is what I was saying earlier. If the projected spot curve is above the forward curve, the return on a bond will be less than the one period risk-free rate of interest and vice versa. Okay, I was implying something like that when I was telling you about the relationship between spot and forward curves. The bond's maturity influences the sensitivity of the bond's return. All right, so we know that going back to level one. So the bond, the sensitivity of a bond's return, we know that is a function of right the bond's maturity, which is related to duration and convexity, which we don't get to in this particular reading, but of course we get to sometime later. All right, how about some strategies here? Riding the yield curve. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to buy bonds that have maturity dates that are longer than the investment horizon. Now, this is very different than what we're going to learn with bond immunization, where we're going to find a bond that has a duration to match our investment horizon. That's called immunizing a bond portfolio. And what that does is that, of course, it, of course, it boy, I want to say this. I want to say it, it eliminates interest rate risk, but of course it doesn't. Uh, it, it might under certain circumstances. We can talk about that during another slide deck. But that's what writing the yield curve means. So describe the strategy. And in fact, I think one of those uh, practice questions inside the reading is a real simple question that says something like, you know, which one of these strategies is writing the yield curve? And so there's the answer with maturity longer than the investment horizon. So Upward sloping yield curve, downward sloping yield curve. All right, so look at those two. Forward curve is above, forward curve is below. We did talk about that. Total return on bonds with a longer maturity relative to the investment horizon would be greater than the return on a matching strategy of maturity and investment horizon. And then, of course, the opposite is true with the downward sloping yield curve. So strategy of riding the yield curve, what are we trying to do? We're trying to outperform just a regular old, hey, I have 10 years to go uh, on my investment horizon, I'll buy a 10-year bond. So riding the yield curve tries to take advantage of the difference in the slopes between the spot and the forward curve. Yeah, we felt compelled to put this slide in here. No guarantee. Let me repeat that. Let me shout it. No guarantee that the yield curve will remain unchanged over time. Not as profitable when interest rates rise. So we need to consider that this is not some kind of a hedging strategy like the bond immunization that I just spoke about a minute or two ago or using uh, derivatives to either increase or decrease risk. This writing, the yield curve, pays off sometimes, and it doesn't pay off at other times. Oh, this is a fun one here. So how about the swap rate curve? So what do we know about swaps and swap contracts? So here's the example that I give my students all the time. You ready for this? Let's suppose that, that you have a backyard and you have a beautiful peach tree in your backyard. You go out every day, and let's just suppose for some reason you're Peach harvest is annual, right? So you can you can eat these peaches year round, and you're eating these peaches, and you're cutting the peaches up, and you're feeding to them your to your spouse, and, and and you're feeding them to your children. But your neighbor has an apple tree, beautiful apple tree, and he or she is doing the same thing. So sooner or later, you and your family, you're going to get sick of peaches. Sooner or later, that family over there is going to get sick of apples. So sooner or later, of course, you're going to swap. So you can agree to swap. And in the simplest example, we're going to swap cash flows, right? In this interest rate swap, we're going to swap peaches for apples. And let's just suppose it's an equal exchange. So, you know, every day you go, you, you hand over 10 peaches and, and you get 10 apples. 
Now, over time, this might work, but sooner or later, there's going to be a little worm that shows up in the peach or the apple. So, so what happens then is that you're going to have to come. If you, if we have peaches that have worms in them, we're going to have to compensate the apple dude over there for accepting a less than quality peach. And the same thing happens with an interest rate swap. We're swapping fixed for floating cash flow. And sometimes there's a worm in the cash flows and sometimes they're not. So your position in an interest rate swap either, either increases or decreases in value depending on whether interest rates go up or interest rates go down. So look at that definition of the interest rate swap, plain vanilla interest rate swap exchange, a fixed interest, for a, a fixed interest rate for a floating rate commonly traded and most liquid. Now, I promise you there, there might be some bartering commodity swap with peaches and apples, but it's probably not commonly traded and it's probably not too terribly liquid. However, if you think about what the fixed leg and the floating leg are betting on, they're betting, they're betting that they don't have a worm in their cash flows, whether they're fixed or floating, so that if they want to get out of the swap, then they get compensated for it. So here's the traditional illustration of fixed rate goes to the left, Floating rate goes to the right. Floating rate is the London Interbank offered rate, although that may or may not change as we move through the next decade. Now, what's important about a swap contract is this swap rate. So the swap rate is another name for the fixed rate demanded by the receiver of a swap to exchange those uncertain floating rate payments over time. So what we can do then is that we can have a, we could have a one week swap, we could have a one month swap, we could have a one year, two years, five years, or a thousand year swap, probably not a thousand years, but I promise you, if you have a thousand year bond, you're thinking to yourself, I might need a thousand year swap. Now, what we can do then is we can construct a swap rate curve. Sometimes it's just called a swap curve. And this is going to be a par curve because when you enter the swap, neither party uh, has to pay for anything, right? So the fixed rate is computed. And I think we do that in level three, where I'll show you how to compute that fixed rate so that neither party has to uh, pay the other at, in, at the inception of the swap. So it's kind of referred to as kind of a par curve. But here, this is a good LOS here. Why, why do we use these things? to help us value bonds. Let me go back to what I said in that very very first slide so we can use we can use spot rates, we can use we can use forward rates, we can use yield to maturity and there are others that we didn't talk about in this slide deck. We could use yield to call or yield to put. I mean, we could use all those kinds of interest rates as discount rates, but what added value does a swap rate pose for us if we're trying to value a bond? either today or next week or sometime in the future. And that first uh, shaded block is super important. That lots of financial markets are regulated throughout the world. And so interest rates that come out of regulated markets may or may not reflect the true reality of supply and demand conditions and money supply conditions and all that kind of stuff. So the swap market is unregulated making swap rates more comparable over different jurisdictions. Now, this is probably super appropriate and relevant for large banks because large banks that have, you know, they've got these huge balance sheets and somewhere on the balance sheet, they have risks, whether it's on the liability side or the asset side, and they use derivative securities and they use swap contracts to manage that risk. So this swap rates are probably way more acceptable for a large bank to use, not only because it's unregulated, but because they apply to the balance sheet items. Maybe for a local domestic bank that doesn't use any derivatives, maybe maybe swap rates are not as appropriate. Maybe they can just use uh, par rates or, or spot rates. But of course, as you can imagine, notice the last part of that, uh, it reads over different jurisdictions. So that means, you know, all over the world, those swap rates uh, 
can be comparable and they can be used as benchmarks that don't have any of that any of that noise regulatory noise coming in and impacting that rate all right how about the second one swap spread reflects incremental credit risk all right so this is what i was saying earlier about you know you have a small local bank where you got these large new york city banks or london banks um, uh, that use derivatives all the time. So that swap rate and then the swap spread will help measure incremental credit risk. Yeah, curve is influenced by supply and demand conditions. Yeah, that makes sense. Wide range of maturity swap market. Okay, of course you can get a swap uh, over almost any time period. Remember, there's no uh, there's no organized exchange for swap markets. It's all over the counter and they can be customized and tailored to fit your unique needs. Although, although, you know, there are standardization processes uh, to make this thing more liquid. I think the reading makes a comment that uh, references a total swap market notional principle in, I forget what year it was, 2013 or so, of $370 trillion. I don't even, I don't even know what that means. I can't wrap my arms or my head around all those zeros. Now here's the, uh, here's the swap rate formula that I was saying to you just a little bit earlier. We're gonna have to compute this uh, at another level. Um, swap rates, Notice all we're doing is discounting, right? So we're just discounting one plus S, one plus X. So we're just we're just trying to compute present values here. And then the price of a swap contract is gonna be the difference between present value of the fixed leg and the present value of the floating leg. I'll show you that a different day. So let's take a look at an example. There's the spot curve, 2% and 4%. So let's use that to determine the swap rate curve. So that swap rate for year one is 2%, right? So that at initiation, the contract is $0 on both sides. But then for time period two, all we're doing is substituting in, let me go back here and make sure, yeah, there's the 4% over two years. And so if you do the quick, uh, if you do the quick algebra, you get 3.96, explain the swap rate curve and how they use it. So this helps explain how that swap rate is determined and then you can infer from that whether the swap rate curve is upward or downward sloping. Now let's move on from the swap rate to the swap spread. And so this is just going to be a difference, just like any difference. Uh, swap spread is the difference between the swaps fixed leg, right, swap rate, and the yield to maturity on the government bond yields with the same maturity. And of course, we want to use the on the run issues um, if we can. <laughs> the fixed interest rate payer pays the swap spread. All right, so how are we going to use this? What does this say? Calculate and interpret, right? So we're measuring credit worthiness of the major banks. This is what I said to you a little bit earlier indicating the liquidity of default free bonds. That makes perfect sense then. And then to detect market mispricing. So let's look at that last arrow point. Investors require higher compensation for credit and liquidity risks, of course, when that swap spread is high. So here we have just a super quick example. 5% minus 4.6% gives us 0.4% of a swap spread. Let's move on to traditional theories of term structure, which I think I said earlier in the slide deck that this might be my most favorite part to discuss because let's just remember what we're trying to do here. We're trying to come up with some kind of a theory that explains interest rates today, although we can, we can observe those interest rates today, at least we ought to be able to observe them, but then trying to figure out what interest rates are going to be uh, a year from now or two years from now or may maybe even a thousand years from now. So these are academic theories on the term structure of interest rates and I want to make sure that you understand that while academic theories may not always have perfect applications, what they do is that they provide us with bricks <laughs> and maybe a handful of bricks, maybe lots and lots of bricks, maybe a thousand bricks <laughs> 
upon which we can build some kind of a thought process to be able to have a better handle on the interest rate path. So we can start with unbiased expectations theory. I learned it as the pure expectations theory way back when I was in graduate school. And I want to read that first uh, circle point to you. Suggests that the forward rate is an unbiased predictor of future spot rates. <laughs> you should scratch your head and say, wait a minute, didn't, didn't we just talk about how it is not an unbiased predictor of future spot rates? Well, it is an unbiased predictor if, if, notice that second circle point, assumes risk neutrality. What that means is that bondholders in general are neutral regarding risk. That means that they don't, they're not affected by risk. They don't care about uncertainty and they don't attach risk premiums. So in that state or under those conditions, then the forward rate is an unbiased predictor of the future spot rates. Now, remember what unbiased means. It means a lot of things, but <clears throat> In statistics, it simply means that when you make an error in predicting something in the future, your error is sometimes going to be above and sometimes going to be below, and there's no way that you can tell or predict whether you are above or below. But we just learned that that is probably not true a few slides ago. Now, there's a very short explanation of local expectations theory, which is way narrow interpretation. And what it assumes is that the expected return on bonds with varying maturities is really identical over just short term periods. And that's probably because of arbitrage during those short term uh, time periods. But over the long term, this is not true because you have things like interest rate risk, which we'll talk about in a later slide deck specifically duration and convexity, and then reinvestment rate risk. Now, I was always fascinated by this market segmentation theory when I was in graduate school because when you go back to um, the expectations theory and then you go forward to liquidity preference theory there, I'm skipping ahead just a little bit, um, those, those models have some, you know, pretty elementary math in them, but they still have some math in them. But this market segmentation theory is just a thought that the markets are segmented, that there's a short-term market and there is a long-term market, and that some individuals and institutions like short-term and some individuals and institutions like long-term, maybe some like mid-term, and that they focus on that. They have a maturity preference. And so the markets are segmented, which means that the yields on short-term bonds and medium-term bonds and long-term bonds are determined by, and here's probably the answer to an exam question, in the market segmentation, segmentation theory, the yields are determined by supply and demand conditions for those specific, unique, time segments, short term, medium term, and long term. Now, the preferred habitat theory is very similar to market segmentation theory, but what this tells us just specifically is that not only do specific borrowers and lenders prefer a unique market, but, but they don't ever switch back and forth. Like a short term borrower or never all of a sudden show up one day and say, hey, I want a 1,000 year loan. Now, the liquidity preference theory is actually a piggyback theory. Let me go back here. A piggyback theory on top of the pure expectations theory in which there is a liquidity premium added to the yield. And this is the example that I give students all the time. All we're saying is that uh, suppose I came to you and said, hey, let me borrow $100 and I'll pay you back next month one month from today. And you look at me and you say, okay, Jim, here's your assets, here's your uh, expenses, here's your income, here's everything about you financially, I'm gonna charge you 10%, right? But then if I come back immediately and say, hey, let me borrow another $100 and I'm gonna pay it back in a thousand years, you go through that same thing, but you say, all right, Jim, you know, your income and your assets, et cetera, et cetera. But then you're thinking, you know what? If I lend Jim $100 for a month, I only have to do without that $100 for one month. 
what could happen in a month? <laughs> well, a lot's good, but it's only one month, right? And then you look at me after my second request for a 1,000 year loan and you think, man, there's lots and lots of stuff that can happen during that 1,000 year period. I might need that $100 back before the maturity date. So you're going to attach a liquidity premium to the interest rate. So you might charge me 15%. So it's me, right? It's still me. For a one month loan, you charge me, what I say, 10%. And for a a thousand year loan, you charge me 15% because you have to give up liquidity for a longer time period. Think of it kind of like as an opportunity cost. Now, what this means then is that, is that yield curves are probably upward sloping more predominantly than under these other theories because of that liquidity premium. Notice the last circle point down there predicts an upward sloping yield curve. All right, how about some of these factors here? We need to know about the factors with yield curves. So level and steepness and then curvature. And they're probably exactly what you think. What can happen to a yield curve? Over time, uh, interest rates and yields are going to change. So interest rates can go up and they can go down. Now, short-term rates and long-term rates, they can go up by the same uh, percentages, and that's called a parallel shift. So when we have a parallel shift, upwards or downwards, we refer to that as level. Steepness then re re refers to a steepening or a narrowing or a flattening of the curve, meaning that maybe in this case, short-term rates adjust more strongly than long-term rates. So steepness and then curvature means that uh, sometimes in the intermediate term period, you know, you can have something that goes like this and then it bumps or does something else. And so look at what we've written there. Rise in the long-term and short-term parts of the curve with the middle part falling or vice versa. Some people like to call that twisting or uh, something else. So, All right, I like this LOS too because it involves a little bit of math. Uh, explain how a bond's exposure to each of those factors uh, can be measured and how those can help us manage yield curve risks. So what the reading does is identifies uh, DL, DS, and DC as the bond portfolio's sensitivities to changes in, what did we just say, level and slope and curvature. And so what we can do is we can incorporate, incorporate that into some kind of an estimate, which is what we've done in that box there. And so all we're doing is saying, okay, if the level changes by a small amount or the slope changes by a small amount or the curvature changes by a small amount, we can go ahead and determine what happens to the price of the bond. And that delta P over P, right? That's just a, that's a percentage change in the price of the bond. And that's what we're trying to do there. Now I'm guessing that you guys will like this. I could spend hours here telling you about effective duration and key rate duration. These are mentioned just briefly here in the chapter. Notice in parentheses, more of this in a future reading, and these are gonna be super fun conversations, but remember, duration is the old time, and when I say old time, we go way, way back. It's the old time measure of interest rate risk. So it's a measure of bond price sensitivity. What do we know? We know that when interest rates go up, when yields go up, price of the bond goes down. But the price of a one-year bond will fall way less than the price of a 1,000-year bond because of duration, right? So longer-term bonds have a greater interest rate risk. This is calling it price sensitivity here. Inappropriate for identifying and managing yield curve risk associated with non-parallel shifts. So I think this is what you need to know uh, if a question shows up here, that duration, and, and in this case, effective duration can tell us a lot, but what it needs to have is that there is a requirement for a parallel shift in the yield curve. If there's any kind of, here, let me just go back here. If there's any kind of a sloping or curving or twisting, then duration is not very effective in managing yield curve risk.
And that's why, that's why we say, okay, so effective duration is kind of like this, this, this whole thing, right? It's this big picture measure of interest rate risk for a bond. But why don't we key in on the different time periods of a bond, like a one and two and three and four and five and maybe 10, 15 and 20. I have no idea what a key rate duration for a 1000 year bond is, year 900. Of course, I, I could probably figure it out and that's probably pretty simple. But key rate duration measures bond price sensitivity for a small change in a benchmark yield curve at a specific spot rate, like five years or 10 years. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to add our knowledge of effective duration to some kind of a non-parallel twisting of the yield curve at that key rate, at that key time period. What did I say, five years or 10 years? Oh, but here, do we love this more in a future reading? I'm hoping that you're saying to yourself right now, oh, Jim, teach, it, teach us to it now. We can't wait. All right, how about this last LOS? Explain the maturity structure of yield volatilities. All right, so the volatility curve shows term structure of interest rate volatilities. All right, so there's a picture. So we have term to maturity uh, all the way out from zero to 25 interest rate volatility. And so notice that this is downward sloping. Volatility curve measures yield curve risk. So short-term interest rates are more relative, I'm sorry, more volatile relative to long-term rates. And so, of course, this is true probably because we have to take a deep breath and look around and say, what is, what is the Fed doing in the United States with monetary policy? Or is the Fed gonna continue buying up treasury securities? Is the Fed going to continue buying up mortgage-backed securities? What the heck is the Fed going to do? Now, long-term rates are, uh, are still volatile, but less volatile because of uncertainty about, what did I say earlier, you know, growth in the economy and then inflation. And I think that takes us through these learning outcome statements. I'm going to go ahead and say that first one is probably important to know all of those definitions. Uh, as always, whenever we hit those calculate ones, I would always know the calculation. 